Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. Don't forget, I have three other podcasts out there. Canada's Great War, which releases every single Sunday and looks at the First World War and how it impacted Canada. Coast to Coast, which releases every single Thursday and looks at the building of the Transcontinental Railway. And From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday and looks at every Prime Minister in Canadian history. And it's currently on Part 2, looking at the opposition leaders who never became Prime Minister. I do all of these podcasts full-time. The writing, the research, everything. So, if you want to support it, every dollar goes straight to me, and I truly do appreciate it, and I'll thank you directly on the air and through my social media. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. Over the course of many episodes about small towns, I can honestly say that Halton Hills has one of the most unique histories of any community I've come across. It isn't just the story of one town, but of several hamlets and towns that came together into one community in 1974. Due to this, as I go through the history, I'll jump between the communities at first as each was founded at different points in the 19th century, and we'll circle back to talk about the other communities as we go through the years. One common thread, though, through all the histories of these communities is the milling industry, which would help power the Canadian economy throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, the area was occupied by the Attawandaron, who were a people who spoke the Iroquois language. Other groups who occupied the land included the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. By the 1800s, the Mississauga people had moved into the territory, and the Hurons were also drawn to the area thanks to the beauty of the landscape, as well as to hunt, fish, and live in the area. In 1819, the British government would negotiate the purchase of the land of the Mississauga under Treaty 19, and it was from the indigenous that we get the name of Esquissing, which translates as likely, that which lies at end. The communities that make up Halton Hills today have a history that dates back over 200 years. The community of Esquissing was first surveyed in 1818, and it would open to settlement one year later. By the time the first township meeting was held in 1821, the community had a population of 424. As Esquissing was beginning to grow, another community would spring to life. George Kennedy owned land in the area, and in the early 1820s, he would build a sawmill powered by Silver Creek, followed by a woolen mill, grist mill, and a foundry. Around these businesses, a place called Hungry Hollow would grow. In 1837, William and James Barber purchased the mills and land from Kennedy and renamed the community Georgetown in his honor. With Georgetown seeing prosperity arrive, another community named Williamsburg was becoming a major industry center for the area thanks to the mills that were running along the Credit River. This community had begun in 1825 when a man named Ben Williams set up Williams Mill with his son Charles and Joel. The Williams family became the central family of the community, with Charles Williams serving as the Justice of the Peace there in the 1860s, along with being the owner of several mills. As for the original Williams Mill, you can still see that building today. It no longer operates as a sawmill as it did in 1825, but it has been in continued industrial use since it first opened. The Georgetown Electric Light Company power plant operated out of the site in 1898, and today it joins the original sawmill as a historic site that can be enjoyed. Norval would start up in 1820 when James McNabb, a United Empire loyalist who fought in the War of 1812, bought land to build a mill and raise sheep. In 1836, a post office was established, and within 10 years, 200 people were living in the community that had two churches, a grist mill, an oat mill, two stores, and a tavern. 
Acton began life in 1825 when three brothers, all of whom were reverends named Ezra, Zenis, and Rufus Adams, arrived in the area. The settlement slowly grew, and by 1840, there was a mill and a tanner. Originally named Danville, it would later change its name to Adamsville to honor its first three settler brothers. The mills were not the only industry that the area was blessed with in those early years of settlement. Limestone is abundant, and that led to the development of lime kilns along what is now called the Bruce Trail, which goes through the Halton Hills and Limehouse within it. Many of the kilns from the 19th century still stand for the most part, but the largest of them, the Draw Kiln, is currently being restored. Along the Bruce Trail, a train station still exists, and the rail bed for the former Toronto Suburban Railway can also be found near Limehouse, and you can walk the Bruce Trail today and see a lot of history through the community. The community of Acton would go through a change in 1844 when it went from being Adamsville to Acton, named for an area in Acton, London, in England. That name comes from a corruption of Oaktown, which is what the English community was originally named due to the great amount of oak trees found in the area. By 1846, Georgetown was humming along with a gristmill, sawmill, cloth factory, tavern, two tailors, three wagon makers, four blacksmiths, and a population of 700 people. Ten years later, in 1856, the Grand Trunk Railway arrived. This allowed Georgetown to grow even quicker. In 1864, the community became a village, and in 1869, it had a population of 1,500 people. With the arrival of the Grand Trunk Railway, it brought something else to the area, the Iron Bridge. This bridge, which crosses the Credit River, runs for 842 feet, and it's considered an engineering marvel. It was also the longest span on the Canadian National Railway when it was built, and you can still see it today with a visit to the community. In 1852, the community of Williamsburg went through a name change as well, becoming Glen Williams. Two years later, a man arrived in the community and set up a haberdashery shop. This man was named Timothy Eaton, and he would remain several years in the community before he left to start a bakery in Kirkton, Ontario. In 1869, he founded a store at 178 Young Street in Toronto, that would become Eaton's, a Canadian cultural institution that lasted for 100 years. If you head to Glen Williams today, you can see the store that essentially started it all, or at least the building. The same year that Williamsburg became Glen Williams, the general store and post office opened out of a building that again still exists. While it no longer operates as a general store, it's still a great place to visit. The Copper Kettle Club now occupies the building, offering traditional British cuisine and the atmosphere of an authentic British pub. When the railroad arrived in the area in 1856, Adamsville, or Acton, saw a spur of growth as a result. Several businesses began to appear, including more mills, a carriage works, and other establishments. In 1874, the community became a village. In 1870, the Glen Williams Town Hall was built and used for a board meeting that year in the community. Over the years, the building would house many society meetings, church meetings, political meetings, and also served as the polling station for elections. Celebrated Canadian author Lucy Maud Montgomery would stage many of her works in the building with the Union Dramatic Players, and we'll talk more about her later. You can still visit this building in the community and experience its history that goes back nearly to the founding of Canada itself. Even today, the building plays an important part in the life of the community. Did you know that two hockey players from Halton Hills have won nine Stanley Cups in total? The first was born in Acton on August 25, 1880, and his name was Arthur Moore, and he would win four Stanley Cups in a row with the legendary Ottawa Silver Seven from 1903 to 1906. He would end his playing career in 1908, and he died in 1935. And I'll get to the second player in just a little bit. In 1883, a new town hall opened in Acton, and it stands to this day. This two-story brick building provided space for town and organization functions, and it was not only where council met, but it also housed the library, fire brigade, and police. On the top floor, a concert hall operated, 
and the building remained a central part of the community until 1974. Today, the building still stands and you can visit it today and relive 125 years of history. It was also the first designated historic building in the history of Halton Hills. Of course, no talking about Acton Town Hall would be complete without learning about Jimmy the Ghost. Jimmy, the former caretaker, apparently still resides in the town hall. He's best remembered for when he woke up to the smell of smoke and realized that the town hall was on fire. He quickly found the source of the fire and, by himself, put it out as a one-man bucket brigade. Some say he still protects the building to this day. The community of Acton, by this point, had almost 1 million square feet of floor space dedicated to tanneries, which was the main industry in the community. The Beardmore tanneries in Acton would actually become the largest tanning operation in the British Empire by the turn of the century. On August 18, 1895, a man by the name of Henry Thomas Shepard was born in Stewart Town. The son of a former slave who fled the United States via the Underground Railroad, his family would live in the area of Dayfoot Drive Park, and he would spend his entire life living in the community. He attended school there and worked area farms while delivering mail to bring in extra money for his family. When he was old enough, he began to drive bus to take passengers to and from the station. In 1911, Shepard joined up with the military, becoming a sergeant major with the Lawrence Scots Regiment, helping to lead recruits in marches and weapons training. When the First World War broke out, Shepard wanted to do his part and he would enlist with the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Many black Canadians wanted to enlist with the army, but they were turned away by racist recruiters. In the end, only about a thousand black soldiers served in non-segregated units, while over a thousand served the number two construction battalion. I actually talk about black Canadians fighting in the First World War in an episode of Canada's Great War, which you can find on all podcast apps. Shepard was one of the few to be accepted into a non-segregated unit, and he would serve all four years of the war. He would fight at Ypres and the Battle of the Somme. He was also one of only 23 black Canadians to fight at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. During the war, he was wounded twice in battle, and following the war, he would receive the Star and Victory Medals and the General Service Medal. When the Second World War started, Shepard wanted to fight again, but his two wounds from World War I prevented that. Instead, he was recruited to serve as the sergeant major of a company at the Newmarket Training Camp 23. On October 18, 1940, the Globe and Mail would write of Shepard stating that he was, quote, one of the ablest soldiers on the field and the most popular man in the Newmarket sergeant's mess. There is no color line in the Canadian Army, and the rookies take their orders from Sergeant Major Shepard as willingly as they would from the colonel himself, end quote. He would serve there from 1940 to 1944 and used his skills as a former fire chief of Georgetown to lead the firefighting squad at the camp. By 1944, he was the deputy fire marshal for military camps in Ontario, and in June of 1944, he was awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire for fighting a fire that broke out at the camp in the early morning hours. Shepard continued to live in the community until his death in 1960. In 1907, the Glen Woolen Mills Company was organized in Glen Williams, as was the Melrose Knitting Company, which was a subsidiary of the main mill company. That company quickly began to succeed, producing 45,000 dozen pairs of men's wool socks and lumberman's socks every year. Not to be outdone, the Beaumont Knitting Mill would open under James Bradley when he bought the Tweedle Saw Mill, which had been built in 1878. The Dominion Glove Works would then start producing 200 dozen pairs of socks every single day and 40 dozen pairs of mitts and gloves. That business would operate until 1982 when it closed, but you can still visit that building that helped keep so many Canadians warm. Today, it's the Beaumont Mill Antiques and Collectibles. Now you remember when I said there was another player who won multiple Stanley Cups from the area? Well, he was born on May 12, 1922, in Georgetown. His name was Robert Golden Boy Goldham, and he would begin his NHL career with the Toronto Maple Leafs in 1941. Over the course of his NHL career, he would play in 650 NHL games 
recording 171 points as a defenseman. Along the way, he won the Stanley Cup with the Toronto Maple Leafs in 1942 and 1947, followed by three more Stanley Cups with the Detroit Red Wings in 1952, 1954, and 1955. He also played in five NHL All-Star games. After his retirement, he would actually work as an analyst on Hockey Night in Canada for several years. Bob, it seems whenever the Kings come to town, the Leafs have a rather easy time of it. Uh, they beat them last time. In fact, the Kings have only won one game here at the Gardens in the past three seasons. So there's a chance for the Leafs to pick up a couple tonight, perhaps. You know, I, I often wondered that, Brian, because uh, L.A. has some pretty good shooters. They have had for years, and they've always had great goaltending. But every year I keep waiting for them to do something super. And uh, any games I've seen at the Gardens, they've always come out a little flat and he would pass away on September 6, 1991, but in 2015, he was inducted into Canada's Sports Hall of Fame. In 1923, a momentous event would occur in Georgetown when 50 orphans, eventually increased to 109, arrived after enduring the Armenian Genocide, which happened from 1923 to 1927, and it killed an estimated 600,000 to 1.5 million people. The children would be educated at Cedar Vale Farm, which is where Cedar Vale Park now sits. The farm had been purchased by the Armenian Relief Association of Canada. At 135 acres, it would be where the children would learn to farm and grow fruit. And while there were 250,000 Armenian orphans, a Canadian doctor chose the ones best fitted mentally and physically for coming to Canada. Canadians did what they could to help raise money to bring the orphans to Canada, considering each one cost $500 to bring over. A school in Chatham would raise $3,000 for the care and education of the boys, and Mrs. M. Smythe and Mrs. Hugh Kidd would be put in charge of the Georgetown group. One boy, Paul Orderon, would stay at the farm from 1923 to 1927, and he would say in 1985, quote, Canada took care of me, end quote. By 1928, the orphans were placed with families in southwestern Ontario. Most of the children who came to Canada became citizens and important members of our society. Even as late as 1985, 50 of the original 109 orphans could still be found in Ontario, while others settled elsewhere in the country or the United States. Called the Georgetown Boys and Canada's Noble Experiment, many consider this to be Canada's first humanitarian effort. And if you go to the park today, you will find an Ontario provincial plaque honoring this part of our heritage. One interesting fact that would help Hackton stand out in 1925 was when a man named James Matthews passed away. What made him special was that he served as postmaster for Acton since before Canada was a country. With 70 years as a postmaster behind him, beginning in his first year in 1855, he became the oldest postmaster in point of years of service in the entire country, and possibly the British Empire. He only stopped delivering mail six weeks before his death when he was stricken with paralysis at the age of 90. In 1926, Lucy Maud Montgomery, who wrote the Anne of Green Gables series, moved to Norval. This was not a quick stopover for the celebrated author. She would remain until 1936. And while living in the community, she would publish Pat of the Silver Bush and was often seen in the community. Calling Norval one of the prettiest villages in all of Ontario, she would write in her diary, quote, I love Norval as I have never loved any place save Cavendish. It is as if I had known it all my life. End quote. Today, the Lucy Maud Montgomery Memorial Garden exists in the community to honor her time there. The community also celebrates Montgomery Christmas on the weekend of November closest to her birthday, and various Lucy Maud Montgomery seminars and readings are held through the year. Another important Canadian named A.J. Casson had a deep love for Glenn Williams. As a group of seven artists, he wanted to paint the beauty he saw, and he would capture that in 1938 with his painting, Street in Glenn Williams. That painting of a quiet road in Glen Williams would sell for $542,000 on June 1st, 2010, the most ever for one of his paintings. Casson would paint many other works in the community, including Village Street October, Farmhouse near Glen Williams, and Country Road Glen Williams, all of which are now in the Ottawa Art Gallery. 
Most of us, when we think of the setting for a group of seven painting, think of somewhere northern, remote, and inaccessible. And indeed, many of the paintings were like that. But A.J. Casson was the youngest member of the group of seven, and he wanted to do something different. He wanted to stake out a territory that he could call his own. And what he chose were the sleepy southern Ontario villages that he had known all his life. Casson bought a car and used it to travel through the villages of Ontario. He painted the quiet streets and countryside around Elora, Norval, Meadowvale, Glen Williams, and others. What he saw appealed to him for many reasons. It reminded him of his childhood. It was Canadian, and it was a peaceful, ordered existence removed from the growing ferment of modern life. And in finding the Ontario village, Casson found above all what he was seeking, a subject matter substantially different from Carmichael and the rest of the group of seven. Even today, Casson remembers how powerful was the influence of these older, more established artists. Even understand a young person and admiring what they did so much, the influence was too strong. Jackson, for years, begged me to go down to Quebec with him. I was afraid if I went, I'd just paint poor Jackson. So instead of that, I started scouting the Ontario villages and doing them. On January 1st, 1974, Arguably the biggest event in the history of Halton Hills occurred when Georgetown, Acton, Esquissing, and several other hamlets amalgamated into the town of Halton Hills. If you head over to Halton Hills to see the amazing history for yourself, then be sure to check out the Halton Hills Sports Museum. This museum celebrates the history of the sports in the community and many of the individuals who helped put the town on the map with their excellence in sports. The community has had several NHL hockey players, Olympians, baseball players, and more, many of which who are now honored in the Hall of Fame portion of the museum. So come explore the history of the community through the history of sports. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Halton Hills, Ontario. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to CanadaEHX.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randall McCallum, Diane Wade, Lorianne Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.